All right, hopefully that'll be better. Let me start over. Hey, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me now. I'm waiting for somebody to say, yes, they can hear me. Okay, great. Evita says she can hear me. So great, great, great. Okay, let me start all over, you guys. Hey, welcome to my live stream. Today, we're going to really focus on working with your agent in 2023, but I'll take any other questions as well. But that's how I'm going to start. Um, Cindy says she can hear me too. I appreciate it, Sydney. Now, today I have at the very beginning, and I'll post them again, I have my Facebook group. A lot of you are wondering how to you know, be in touch with me outside of YouTube. I have a Facebook group. That link is there. If you need a realtor referral, I have that link there. And then I, I do have a first-time homebuyer's guide for sale that'll take you step-by-step -step through the process so you don't make any costly mistakes. So all of that is posted in this live. You just have to scroll up and I'll post it again later in the evening. But put your questions, any questions about working with your real estate agent. And if you just have any general questions, I'll answer that as well. I'll be here for an hour. So I'll be here till seven o'clock. Again, if you're watching the replay, all of these questions will be time stamped. So you can go directly to the question that you want to answer. So what you want answered answered. So the first one is communication. A lot of times first time home buyers don't know when, um, how often either their lender or how often their real estate agent is going to communicate with them. So you need to have those conversations with your agent. How early can I call you? How late can I call you? How often will I hear from you? Um, have, do you want to be contacted through email or text message or like a live phone call? Have those conversations with your agent. One of the major complaints that um, first-time homebuyers have is the communication with their agent and the or the lack of communication with their agent and the lack of communication with their lender. So that's something you want to get out in front of. Like, how often should I be talking to you? Will you call me during the transaction? How will I know any updates? All of those types of things. So please, um, you know, make sure you're having that conversation with your agent. Some of the things that I used to put in place was I'm going to make sure whether you're, you know, whether we were showing property or not showing property, I'll try to call you every Friday. So every Friday, regardless of, you know, whether we have a house to see or we don't have a house to see, we'll just touch base by phone every Friday. So then at least, you know, because during the transaction, you, you're usually in communication. But usually, you know, if you're just, you know, waiting for a property to come on the market, you may not be in frequent communication. So I would say that at least once a week, we're going to actually get on the phone and talk to one another. And we may text during the week. So, you know, have that conversation with your real estate agent. If you have any questions, you guys, about um, working with your agent, please, you know, either whether you're working with an agent right now or you're thinking about hiring your first real estate agent, um, please put those questions in the chat. Um, all right. Thanks, Chef Brooklyn. Um, yes, I'm just getting started, Miss Jones. So you haven't missed anything. Please put your questions in the chat. So just make sure, again, the number one complaint I hear when first time homebuyers specifically are working with their real estate agent is the lack of communication. Like they don't hear from them. They don't know what's going on, that sort, sort of thing. Please hit the like button. Um, Tom is reminding everyone. I appreciate that. All right. I'm going to answer this question, but again, um, please put any questions in there. Okay. So there's not necessarily a best credit score, and it's going to vary by lender, but I would say above a 720, you're going to get the best interest rate. So above a 720, you're going to get the best interest rates for most lenders. However, you um, for FHA, for example, all you need is a 580 to um, you know get an FHA loan. So that's like the minimum credit score. You will see sometimes people say FHA at 500, but that's if you're putting 10% down. So if you're doing a 3.5% FHA loan, meaning you're putting a 3.5% down payment, then that credit score is at least a 580, a 580 minimum. And you know, you might not get the best credit scores at that, at that, sorry, you may not get the best interest rates at that credit score. So in order to get the best credit scores, and this is not the um, this is not with every lender because every lender has different um, criteria, but I would say at about a 720 or higher, you're getting the best interest rates. 
Um, and you can ask your agent that, your lender that specifically, you know, what at what credit score do I need to be at to get the best interest rate? So I would say, um, you know, 720 is going to get you the best rate. But sometimes if you wait too long, like we're in this environment, um, you know, say I'm, you're waiting to get a 720, but just the market interest rates have gone up a percent. So say you were waiting from like, you know, this summer till now to increase your credit score, you're still in a in a worse position, right? Because say you had a 680, your interest rate would have probably been better at that 680 than it's going to be now at a 720 when interest rates are much higher. So you have to think about it. Sometimes you're going to have to hop in before you have that, you know, perfect credit score. Um, because if rates are going to be increasing, then you want to, you know, go ahead and get in when rates are lower. Okay. Um, but good question. And again, it's going to vary by lender, but I would say 720 or higher, you're probably going to be getting the best interest rates quoted to you. But always get three quotes. And I do have um, a site that I recommend. I'm not going to, um, if you come back to this live, I'll make sure I post it in the description. But that website will tell you what people are getting on average in your state at different credit score ranges. So that could be helpful to you. All right. So make sure you guys, um, you are putting your questions in the chat that you look above. That's where I have my Facebook group, my um, my guide that I sell, and I have if you need a, a agent referral. All right, so this is a good question. Um, and again, put all your questions about working with your agent in 2023 as well. Mommy and T, hi, how are you? It says, is it typical for the real estate agent to act as a go between between the client with the client and the lender? Um, sometimes that's my answer. Sometimes, sometimes it may be necessary for an agent to do that. And I've done that before. If I feel like the agent is not giving the proper service to my client, then I may be reaching out to the agent, the lender myself saying, Hey, what's happening here? Please update, you know, um, my client on where her loan is. Is it an underwriting? Is it not an underwriting? they can help with that communication piece because, you know, as agents, we know where your file should be. Like you should be in underwriting right now. We should have had the home appraised by now. We should have, you know, all of those things. We need to make sure those things are moving along because if we're not, you know, on top of that, your earnest money, your deposit, right, may be at risk. So it's in my client's best interest that I'm on top of that of that lender. So because in that contract, I probably have a finance contingency, meaning if my client can't get approved for financing, I can get my client, I could terminate the contract and get my client's earnest money back. But if I don't know what's happening with the lender, I don't know when to ask those questions. So, you know, I'm, you know, following up with that lender saying, oh, hey, where are we in financing? When do they come out of underwriting? I'm asking those questions. Same thing with the appraisal. I probably have an appraisal contingency in that contract that says if this house does not appraise for the purchase price, then I need to renegotiate that contract with the seller. So all of those things make it a high priority that I'm in communication with the lender. So it's not that just the lender talks to the to the buyer and I talk to the buyer. Usually the agent and the lender are in communication as well because we need to make sure we're, we're hitting those deadlines in the contract. So I think that's what you mean, mommy and T. So I don't think we're the go-between, but specifically with first-time home buyers, a lot of them don't know what to ask their lender. So we're making sure those questions are being asked up front because that could really mess up your deal and put your money at risk. Because if something comes up, say on your credit or something comes up in your, you know, your job or anything, and you're not approved for that loan, you could lose your money. And so we want to make sure that doesn't happen. So we're in communication with them. But great question to ask. Um, and I do have a video about um, who does what in the transaction. I would watch that video. It doesn't have that many views, but it's a good video. So you know who does what in the transaction as well. All right. So again, I'm going to prioritize tonight. Any questions about working with your agent? but I'll answer other questions as well. So my second thing, so number one is communication. Talking about how often you'll communicate, how you'll communicate during, you know, after you hire them. And then number two is um, inspections. So there's a, a big list of inspections you could do on a property. 
So the most common is just the basic home inspection where the inspector comes in and they look at everything and kind of point out things to you. But you can get a lot of different things done, you know, before you purchase a home. You can get a, a property survey. You can get, if it's an older home, you get a lead-based paint inspection, you get an asbestos, but all of those things cost money. So what I like to do up front, even before we go under contract, I like to give my clients a list of all the possible inspections that they can get on this home. Because a lot of times, you know, you'll get your basic home inspection and then they'll say, well, I didn't know I can get a radon inspection. I didn't know I can get this inspection. And then it's often too late because, you know, that due diligence period has passed. So you really want to ask your agent up front, what are all the inspections that I could possibly do on this home? So you can make the decision you know, it's going to, all of the inspections cost money. So that's why a lot of first time home buyers don't do like a lot of inspections because they don't have a lot of that in their budget up front. You know, especially if they're paying closing costs, they're paying their down payment. They don't have enough money usually to do all of these inspections, but at least they can look at the inspection list and prioritize the things that they want to do on, um, for that home. So ask your, um, ask your agent for a list of the possible inspections that they could do beyond the basic home inspection that they can do for that home. All right, so I'm going to take some more questions. All right, let's see. Keisha, last week I declined working with an agent because I felt pressured into a new construction development when I clearly stated I wasn't interested as I didn't want an HOA fee and that I only want fixer uppers. So, I mean, that's pretty clear. So number one, you should never feel pressured into a new construction. Like I have a client now that um, is thinking about the new, con well, they really, really want new construction. I think they can should consider resales, but they were very firm with me. We only want new construction. And the reason why I want them to consider resales is because I think they'll get a little bit more for their money. Um, you know, they want a larger home and they're at a certain price point, but they are adamant that they want new construction. So, you know, after they told me that, I said, OK, I'm only going to show you new construction. And we are kind of at an impasse because the new construction that they want is is 50,000 to 100,000 over what they're approved for. So it's kind of like, okay, but you know, I you I could bring up again, hey, think about these resales, but they've been very clear that they only want to think about or consider new construction. So once you're very um clear with your agent, like I don't want to consider any new construction properties or I don't want any um any properties with HOAs including new construction properties with HOAs, then they should respect that. Um, and I think sometimes they'll push back a little bit on that due to, you know, you closing yourself off from things. So for example, if somebody tells me in Georgia that they want a, you know, a new construction home with no HOA, I know, you know, most new subdivisions in at least Georgia have an HOA. So that's going to diminish your, um, your possible, um, your inventory, like your possibilities, right? But, you know, you still have to be very clear that if that's not what you want, I know I'm wasting my time showing you anything, you know, that you don't want. So I would, you know, I'd probably move on or I'd have another conversation with that agent to say that maybe she doesn't understand how much like that's an, a deal breaker for you. Like make sure you made it clear that an HOA is a deal breaker for you and don't show me anything that has an HOA. Um, maybe give them another chance maybe they weren't that clear. Cause I can understand how, you know, people are thinking, Hey, this is a great, you know, this is in your price range is a great home. And they may think that you would reconsider, um, that HOA. All right. Great question though. A great comment. I don't know if it was a question, but it was a great comment. All right. So Miss Jones, in your experience, if a client has a decent score, like 750 or higher, but low income under 45,000, how likely is it that they can buy a home single person? It really depends on the, the average sales price, okay? Um, credit scores will help you a little bit because, you know, sometimes when you have a higher credit score, they'll allow for a higher debt to income ratio. All right. If you don't know what a debt to income ratio is, I've done a video about can you afford a house? You should watch that video. But when you have a higher credit score, most lenders will allow for a higher debt to income ratio because your credit is so good. Right. 
However, that doesn't make you, you know, you were approved for 200,000. That doesn't make you approved for 300,000. It's really income is even more important than debt to income ratio sometimes, right? So you have to, let me say in this environment, I would say for 45,000, you might get approved for something, maybe low 200,000. I'm just guessing right now. Um, and they're not, there's not a lot of inventory, right? That falls in that price range, depending on where you live. So even though you have, you know, you're in the best position, right? Nobody can say, okay, I'm going to increase your income, right? You have good credit. So you'll be at the top, the top of what you can be approved for, for that 45,000, depending on your debt, but that still is going to um, limit your possibilities based on your average average home price. Like the average home price in my area is 400,000. So, you know, there might be like one or two homes that might fall under 200,000. So it just makes it more difficult. Usually when I'm working with a client like that, I'm like, okay, where are homes? So if you come to me and you say I'm approved for 175, I'm going to look at my MLS and say, these are areas that have homes in that price range. And they're usually farther out from the city. They might be townhomes when you want a single family home. They may be a three bedroom, one bath when you want a three bedroom, two bath. We have to have that conversation. OK, you know, you may have to change some of what you think or thought that you were going to purchase um, based on your income. And some people are willing to work with that. And some people are like, no, I'm not you know, going to do that. So it's not that. Um, what was your question? Can they buy a home? So you can buy a home. I've had it happen, you know, during the pandemic. Um, you know, I really specialized in first time home buyers. They were not making a lot of money because they all, most of them, I'll say 80% of them qualify for some kind of down payment assistance. So we were able to find those homes. The majority of them were resales. I would say, you know, 60% of them were resales, probably another 40, I would say 70% resales, 30% new construction. But it's possible, but I don't know what your average um, home price is right now. So possible, but you're going, it's going to take you longer, right? And you may have to, you know, change some of your criteria of home, depending on your area again. All right. Thank you, Ms. Jones, for that question. So we talked about communication, a list of inspections, working with your agent. And then third, um, and I have four, third, how soon can you see a property? So if homes come on the market, Either, you know, a lot of things are happening. Either agent's going to send you a home that might meet your criteria. You may send your agent a home that meets your criteria. You're probably getting emails or text messages of properties that meet your criteria. You have to have a conversation with your agent about how soon can you set up a showing? How soon can I see that house? Because it may be that you're off that day, right? So you're like, oh, this house came on the market. I'm off that day. Can you show it to me? You know, at one o'clock and the agent's like, well, I have another client. I have something else that comes up. Can you see, I used to have this rule. I would say if you, you know, if, if there's a house that we want to see and we find it before 12 noon, I'll show it the same day. If it's something that comes on the market at 6 PM or 4 PM that you want to see, I'll show it to you within 24 hours. That was my rule. Cause I figured, okay, as long as we see it within 24 hours, we should be able to get an offer in when things got really busy. We had to see it the same day. I would use showing agents. It may not be me showing you the property. It could be a showing agent, but as long as we, you got to see it within that, you know, period, um, then, you know, that would work. So just have that conversation about how quickly can you show property? How quickly can your agent show you property? All right. So that's the third thing. I have four things on this list. I want to make sure you guys are talking about. Let me see. Jamaican Black Queen. I had a student loan forgiven. Does that affect your credit score when they remove it from your credit? So congratulations on getting your student loan forgiven. I would say typically yes, um, because removing a type of credit will impact your credit mix. But your credit mix is only 10% of your overall credit score. It's just like if you paid off your car loan, for example, when you pay off your car loan, typically, um, if you had a car loan, typically your, your credit score is going to go down, you know, the next month after your payoff, that sort of thing, because you don't have that much of a credit mix anymore. And that's impacted. But what I've seen from different people is that their credit typically rebounds. 
um, within like three to four months back to where it was before they paid off that debt. So it's always better because people go back. I don't, you know, you don't want to keep a debt so you can keep, you know, don't lose a couple of points on your credit re credit report. You want to get rid of that debt, particularly car debt, because that's going to impact your debt to income ratio. So even if your credit score goes down a little bit, guess what? You'll be able to be approved for much more because now that debt isn't part of your debt to income ratio. So don't worry about the the temporary typical the temporary impact to your credit um, score when debt is paid off. Go ahead and start paying off that debt. Um, you know, I've done a whole video about my credit score. My credit score may fluctuate between like an eight eight um, eight thirty or so, eight forty seven, depending on when you look at it. Um, but you know, I don't have any car loans. I do have a mortgage. It's like, I don't worry about, but I paid off car loans in the past. And I didn't worry about like my credit score, you know, because I know it's not going to impact that much. So yes, but don't worry about it. That's my answer. <laughs> All right. So mommy T says, thank you so much because my agent is fabulous, but it seems like she is the go-between for my situation. Yeah. She's probably just, you know, looking out for you and advocating for you and making sure she has everything, you know, going smoothly, right? All right, so I'm going through these questions. I'll kind of go back up a little bit. Please hit the like button. I appreciate it. My Our FICO score is usually around the same as your median credit score. Um, it all depends. Your FICO score is the score that, there's so many different scores out here, right? But the FICO score is what lenders are looking at particularly mortgage lenders. They're looking at your FICO score. So what I tell people is some people want to pay my FICO, you know, to get the actual scores. That's going to be the closest to what, um, to what lenders see. If you're that, you know, you want to have the exact amount, but I use credit wise, which is a free product from capital one. And it kind of, it gives you, um, your transunion score and it's pretty close to it. Like, um, I'm not paying my FICO for a score because I'm not like actively trying to get a mortgage, but a, a lot of people that are like, they want to know exactly what it is or very close to what it is. They pay my FICO for that score. Um, all right. So let's keep on going. My last thing is, sh um, sh sending your, so typically when you're working with your agent, you're pre-approved already. Like when they take you on as a client, you have an approval, but sending your your agent homes to see like homes that you want to see that are that are way above your pre-approval amount okay because unless it's been on the market for a long long time and you think they're going to take a much lower offer again you're wasting a lot of your time so for example you're pre-approved for 350 but you're sending them things 400,000 450 500,000 that's going to create some conflict and that's another time you need to talk again and say okay hey you're pre-approved for 450 why are you sending me things for 500,000 why are you think sending me things for 550 and i don't know if it's the hope that they're going to come down 100,000 or they're going to come it, it depends on your market but unless something's been on the market for a really really long time it's you know not it's not practical sometimes to think that somebody's going to come off that much off their price. I usually do like a 10% above. I wouldn't stop just at 350. I might do like 375. And then, you know, that would be kind of, you know, the wiggle room for my clients. But just make sure that you're in a reasonable amount. And even with the 375, you know, you're probably in a balanced market or a buyer's market. You're not in a seller's market coming in at 350 or something 375. But if something's been on the market for a while and it's at the higher price range, then we could make a lower offer um, on that amount. But you want to, you know, have a reasonable expectation of how much higher you can look at. So if you're, again, if you are approved for 350, how much higher is reasonable for you to still be looking in that price range? All right. And that's going to depend on your market as well. So be mindful of that. All right. So those are my four little tips that I wanted to share with you. I'm going to go through the list and I'm going to answer as many questions as possible um, on, and I'll prioritize the ones about working with your agent. So questions about working with your agent in 2023, that will be good. Okay. Sylvia says, how do you know when to fire your agent? Sorry if this was already asked. 
ask. I think if you're having just major conflicts or um, like you can't get on the same page, you want to make sure you and your agent are on the same page. Like I said, about communication. How often are you seeing property? Um, you know, are you feel like they're working on your behalf and not just kind of pushing you in one direction? All of those things. But a lot of a lot of first time hire buyers, particularly, and I have a I have a video on when to hire and fire your agent. And I'll tell you my story because somebody tried to fire me after um, after I had we had found I found her a house. We were under contract. She changed her mind about that house and we were terminating that contract. Then she got another agent to show her a house like this the next day or so. Right. And they wanted a contract in that on that house. Now, I still had a buyer's brokerage agreement with her. Right. And. So I still got paid. So you need to make sure. So that other agent, because he didn't have an agreement with her, it's a long story. And I explained it in that video, but I was able to still earn my commission because I, she was my client at the time she went under that contract. So make sure that you understand it's probably not a good idea for you to fire your agent after you're under a contract because either, you know, you could fire them. They don't have to work for you anymore, but they still in a lot of cases in a lot of states have earned that commission are still going to get paid and you have nobody representing you sometimes. Right. Um, so I always advise you, number one, have a conversation. If you're not under contract, it's much easier to fire your agent. Typically you can do it within an email. You, you sign a termination and that's what she should have done before she went under contract. I would have sent her a termination. Here you go. We don't work with each other anymore. Now, after you're under contract, you need to probably talk to that that agent's broker. If you're having problems with that agent, you probably need to talk to their broker if you're already under contract. Because if the way agents work, if, if your agent is not a broker, they're working under a broker. All agents have to work under a broker if they're not a broker themselves, right? So you want to pr pretty much go to their boss and say, hey, you know, I'm working with blah, blah, blah. And this is what's happening. I need some help. They'll either assign you to another agent. They may work with you themselves, depending on how large this brokerage is. That's the better thing for you to do. But if you feel like you can't come into an agreement with your agent or you're not just on the same page, right, then go ahead and fire. It's not hard to fire an agent for them, you know, your buyer's agent. Maybe a little bit more difficult if it's a listing agent. Because sometimes you may be um, responsible for some of their marketing if they started marketing your home. But when you fire your your buyer's agent, they typically haven't you know had that many fees or anything like that that you are responsible for. So it's very easy just to send them an email. Hey, you know I don't think this is working out. Or you have a conversation with them. I don't think this is working out. I want to terminate our agreement. If you're not even in an agreement, it's very easy. Just send them an email and say, hey, um, I don't want to work with you anymore and kind of give them some reasons because that would be helpful for them in their business. But um, I, you know, I just think when you feel like you're not being served, right, or you're not on the same page as to what you want to do, then it's a good time to fire them. But be very cautious if you're firing them after you're already under contract because you want to make sure that that person is still going to be representing you well as they take you through closing. Because a lot of times, again, once they find you the house, they pretty much earn their commission at that point. And you want to make sure somebody is still representing you. But good question, Sylvia. But watch that watch that video, um, how to hire and fire your agent. Um, Miss Murph, is it good for an agent to also be a loan officer? I say no. Like I want those those two jobs separated. I need somebody that's working for me and finding me a house and negotiating that contract. And I want somebody else to be my lender. I don't like the double, the, you know, the double dipping basically. I want, you know, two separate people in that transaction. Um, I do know somebody that was in our Facebook group that was doing it and it did not work out well. Um, because again, if I want to shop around for my lender, which I, ex I expect you guys to do like to at least get three quotes with three different lenders. Some people don't feel like, you know, they have that, the right to do that, I guess, because they're already, they're their agent and their lender. Um, so I like them both separated. You want to find, you know, a lender and then you want to find an agent. And I know a lot of agents do a lot of agents do credit repair. And I just like agents to be like finding me the house and negotiating that transaction and somebody totally different to be doing the, being the lender. So I'm not a good, um, I'm not a proponent, I guess, of the agent doing both of those things.
And then the other thing is, I think there's a separation. A lot of people don't want the agent knowing all their business. By law, we don't know like your credit. Unless you share it with us, we don't know your credit. We don't know your finances. We don't know any of that because by law, there's some privacy there, right? Because your lender can't share certain things with us unless you give them permission to share like your private information with us. But if your agent is also your your um if your agent's also your lender, they know everything about you. There's no privacy because they they're representing you on both sides. So just you know be mindful of that as well. I'm going through I'm going back up to making sure I don't um miss anybody. But I think I got everybody at the top. And then I do have a moderator. If the moderator, if you find somebody's question that I'm missing um, from the top, then you could just post it again. That'd be helpful. All right. Okay. Let me say this. I'm trying to think. Agents I've met put me on an automatic listing after I say I want a small property, 200K. I do this myself, Redfin, Trulia. Is it because inventory is low in New Jersey or realtors looking for bigger commissions? Probably because inventory is low. Um, if, and let me tell you guys for, you know, first time home buyers, how it typically works. There's an MLS system. And that system is where when somebody lists their property, an agent lists a property, they put it in this, it's called a multiple listing system or service. And they put the their listing on there and all agents have, all licensed agents have access to that. And that's how Realtor.com, Trulia, Zillow, that's how they get their information is from this multiple listing service. We just, on our end, get a little bit more detail. And then our, our MLS does get updates. So it gets updated. When something goes under contract, we know it's under contract. And Zillow or Trulia may still show it as being available. So that's some of the differences between the systems. But when they're initially setting you up, right? They're setting you up and they're putting your information in. You want a three bedroom, two bath, and you want it between, you know, zero, right? To, or, you know, $1 to $200,000. All the homes that fall in that category are going to come up. And if the average price in the area that you're thinking about is say 700,000, they're not going to be that many properties under 200,000. So they may be few and far between. And as soon as a new one comes up that matches that cr criteria, you either get that text texted to you or you get an email to you. And usually your agent gets that as well. So that's how that system works. But yeah, they're not, um, yeah, they're not trying to get you more money. They know what you're approved for. So if you're only approved for a certain amount, then that's where they cap that amount at. Um, and even if you're approved for more, so say if you're approved for 500,000, but you come to me and say, hey, I don't want to spend more than 350, then I'm capping your search at 350. And I won't even show you anything higher because a lot of times people have a certain mortgage payment that they want to make sure they stay under regardless of what they qualify for. So yeah, I don't think that they're trying to get you to spend more. That's a hard pr price point. There's just not a lot of inventory for that price point. All right. So somebody's asking about an agent. So I'm going to put in the comment, I'm going to put these in the comments. Um, if you need a referral, I have a referral link. Um, I'll put that and then I'm putting, what else am I putting in there? Again, I do recommend don't buy your a house without my guide because it's going to take you step by step through it. So I went ahead and reposted both of those. All right, let me see what this says. Would you recommend or is it possible for someone in their late 20s, early 30s to use their 401k for the down payment and closing costs as a first time single home buyer? Yes. So you do have access to your 401k, your Roth IRAs, your, your retirement accounts to use some of that money for your down payment. Now, there may be some penalties associated with that. Now, a Roth because you you can use some of it for, I don't need to do a whole video on this, but your Roth allows for you to use some of those things for your, like your down payment. You can take out your contributions without um, penalty in a lot of cases, but your 401k during the pandemic, they, they, um, 
reduce some of those penalties. So people were taking their money out for their you know, house or their down payment and their closing costs. But some of those penalties may still be there. So the answer is yes, but you want to check with your 401k administrator to find out are there any penalties for you pulling that money out. And even if there are no penalties, if you're using it for your house, you have to think about you are reducing the, um, the growth of your retirement account. So that's one of the, the, the sorry disadvantages of using your 401k money for your down payment and your closing costs is because the money that you no longer have that money growing for your retirement. So just be mindful of that. You want to talk to your 401k administrator and find out, are there any, I'm buying my first house, how much money am I able to pull out of my 401k? And are there any penalties for me removing money from my 401k for my down payment or closing costs? All right. Thank you so much. Somebody says, I'm waiting for a champion says, I'm just waiting for my appraisal to come back. Now I'm having mixed emotions, but I heard that was normal. Yes. So it's normal to have like a little bit of fear, anxiety when you're buying your first house. I have a video about your appraisal as a buyer. You can watch that. That might calm your nerves, but um, it's uh, that's really normal. All right. Sheila says, I contracted with an agent, but decided to move to Florida. But now that I have returned to South Carolina, do I need to contact her? I believe the contract was in place as of July. So I think, yes, you could just, um, you can just contact her, call her, email her and say, Hey, I'm decided not to move to South Carolina. I think that's what you're saying. I'm moving to Florida. You could terminate that contract. Okay. So it's pretty easy to terminate the contract. Another thing, and then I see her contracts in place of July, 2023. I never do a, a buyer's brokerage agreement more than 90 days. So you may want to follow that rule when you're in, um, in contract with, um, you know, going under contract with a buyer's agent. Some of them do it for a six months. Some people do it for a year. I do mine for 90 days, just so we're both kind of seeing, do we want to work together? Right. And and on average, even before the pandemic, I felt that I could find somebody a house, house in about 90 days. So I would never do a contract more than 90 days with a client. And then after that 90 days, if we haven't found anything, we say, okay, how's this going? Do we still want to work with one another? And then we go on from there. But typically my buyer's brokerage agreement, I never did for more than 90 days. So if your agent is, you know, saying that they want to do a longer contract with you, just say, hey, you know, it's my first time buying a house. Let's just do a 90 days, see how this goes and kind of go from there. But good question. All righty, let's see. Carmen, I'm under contract for new construction. The lender is asking for a motivational letter explaining why I'm moving to a new state. Any advice and what to include? Okay. All right. Um... I don't know if they're saying motivational or letter of explanation. Sometimes lenders will ask you or underwriters will ask you for a letter of explanation saying, why are you doing certain things, right? So in all of these letters, you're going to keep them very, very brief. Like don't give them any more information than what they need. So they're really trying to find out, they're trying to usually make sure that you're moving and you're going to be living in that house. So if you're moving for work, say, hey, I'm moving from Georgia to Florida because my job is transferring me, period. Sign, thank you, <laughs> you know, respectfully in your name. Just keep it very brief. I'm moving because my fam, to be closer to my family. Thank you. You know, don't try to write these whole long, you know, long letters about what happened. Sometimes they'll ask you to explain different things on your bank statements. They'll ask you to explain why you didn't work for a certain amount of time keep them very brief. You're not trying to give them a whole like novel about what's happening in your life. If they need more information, they'll ask you for more information. So my answer is keep it very brief um, because sometimes they just want it in your file just in case they have to look for it later to say, okay, why is she moving? What is happening? So again, my, my um, advice is to keep it very brief. And in that, um, in my first time home buyer guide that I'm talking about, I give you different examples of um, things that lenders will ask for, like, you know, for letters of explanation. Okay. 
All righty. Hey, um, this Jacqueline said she missed some of it. Um, rules and topics. I just listed four. When you come back, you'll see it in the replay. And also I'll have them all time stamped within 24 hours. So thank you for joining me now. I appreciate it. If you have any questions about working with your agent, I'm focusing on kind of on that topic, but I'm taking some other topics as well. Thank you for joining me. All right. Good afternoon. Is there a difference with having an 815 score or having a 788? You'll probably get the same interest rates offered to you. There's usually a, a range that lenders look at. Um, I said 720, you'll probably get about the same score. Some may have above 760, but nobody's saying like above 800, you're going to get this and above a 780, you're going to get that. Typically, you know, you're going to get the same the same interest rate offers at an 815 as you would get at a 788. You can ask and maybe some, you know, lenders that may um, give different interest rates for that. But typically most lenders say once you hit that higher threshold of excellent credit, you're pretty much being offered the same rates in that range. But good question. Um, moderator saying you're doing a good job. Thank you, Miss Jones. All right, let me see. I spent, Dean, I spent some of my money that was going toward my closing costs, but we'll have it back seven days prior to closing. Can that break the deal? No, typically no, right? Unless um, but lenders are not going to say, hey, they'll say, okay, this is your down payment. These are your closing, closing costs. Say it's $10,000, right? And when you're going through underwriting, they may say you only they may see you only have eight thousand dollars in your account. They're gonna be like, okay, as long as you're gonna have that, you know, you know, ten thousand dollars by closing, we're good. They may ask for you know an updated bank statement a couple of days before closing just to make sure. Um, and again, they want to make sure that money. So say that you're supposed to have ten thousand for a closing cost and down payment, and you only have eight thousand. That other two thousand needs to come from you. So either you are, you know, you get paid again and that came from you. Um, maybe you transfer some money from your savings to your checking. It needs to come from you. If you just make a deposit, they are going to question that. And that can be a deal breaker because they're like, okay, where's this money coming from? It has to be a source that you've already shared with them. So uh, an employer, you already shared that you work for them. It could be a savings account or a a retirement account, like we talked about before, you've already shown that you have these income sources. But if you just have a deposit, a random cash deposit, a random transfer, they are going to question where that money came from. And if you're not using like gift funds or something like that, that you've documented, then that could mess up your deal because now they're going to have to question where that money came from. Um, so just be mindful that you'll have the money seven days ahead of time. You can tell your lender, hey, I get paid on the 10th or something like that. And I'll have the money in my account by, you know, that day. But it doesn't break the deal as long as the money is coming from yourself. Right. Or if you said I work for Uber and I'm going to work for Uber a lot more in this next last two weeks to make sure I have this money, then that's fine as well. But no, usually no new sources of income um, unless you've documented it ahead of time. Great question, Dean. All right. And she says, that's what happened to me. The sales agent was sending me higher price homes than my approval letter. Hey, just like sometimes they're trying to stretch you. They're trying to see. But like, for example, if say somebody's approved for 300,000, I may send them something 315 thinking we can negotiate down to 300,000. Right. But I'm not going to send them something 400,000. I'm not going to send them 375. You know, I'm going to it's going to be a reasonable amount above their pre-approval. Um, Miss Amrod's putting the videos on it. Um, all righty. Thank you. All right. Somebody says, how do you feel about Redfin's approach? They do everything for you. Um, I'm not as an agent. Um, Redfin is not the best because they don't pay you as much. Right. So it's, you don't make as much money if you're a Redfin agent that you would if you were working by yourself. So I don't like Redfin for agents necessarily. Now for 
for sellers or sorry, buyers or sellers that hire Redfin, I feel like it's not as personalized. You don't, they just kind of assign you somebody, that sort of thing. So you can't, I don't know how much that person knows about the area. I don't know, you know, what that person's background is. I don't know how much they know about down payment assistance. They just have these agents that may, you know, all work in the metropolitan area. You sign up and then they assign you one. So, you know, and I don't, and again, if you're talking about you're doing your lending with Redfin and they're finding your house and they have your agent, sometimes it is better because it allows for you know you to shop around for the best thing in each area, the best agent, the best lender, the best house. You know, um, sometimes when you're doing everything together, then you may not know if you're getting the best of everything. So I would just say. If you're looking to something like Redfin, also look at some comparisons if you were to do it separately, right? And not just do your lending with them and get your agent with them and get everything with them, like your financing, your agent, or whatever else they offer. All right. No. So good question. Are you a broker as well as an agent? I am an agent. I'm not a broker. I could be a broker, but I'd have to take the test and all that kind of stuff. So I'm not a broker because I don't want, the only reason I would be a broker is because I wanted to have agents under me um, and kind of open my own company. And just because everything was going so fast, you know, how I started, I like the, um, the idea of having an office that did a lot of those things for me. So yeah, I'm not a broker. And usually in most states, you have to be an agent for three years. I've been an agent since 2003, so I can do that. But you have to be an agent, and then you just have to take another test to become a broker. But so good question. Um, so just know that's one of the questions you should be asking your agent. Are you an agent or are you a broker? Because if you know they're an agent, you know there's somebody above them, right? You know if, if they're not a broker, then there's somebody above them. But even sometimes if they're a broker, so say I take my broker's test, but I stay with my agency, I don't break out on my own, I still have a broker over me. So a broker can have a broker, that makes sense, right? Because they're not by themselves, but a lot of people get their broker's license so they can start their own independent real estate company and they don't have anybody above them. So you want to kind of understand, okay, is the agent or broker that I'm working with, are they under a brokerage? And a lot of times you can find that from your contract. Um, did they sign it like with their company or did they sign it with like Keller Williams, you know, Austin or something? And that means that's their broker, right? All right. Good question, St. James. Yelena says, is it weird if the agent states that the lender is requesting proof of funds? No. No, the lender, that's not weird um, because the agent, you know, sometimes lenders will like email the agent, say, hey, we need proof of funds. So they're just saying either maybe they can't get in touch with you, I guess. Or are you saying that the seller's agent is asking for this? I guess let me think um let me explain it from my end if you're if an agent typically the the seller's agent the listing agent will ask the buyer for proof of funds either from their pre-approval letter or something else this is a this is usually asked for if somebody's paying cash so if i make an offer and it's a cash offer they want proof of funds like where's this money <laughs> right they want to say like where is this you know 500,000 that you're paying cash. So you may show them what account it's in, or you get a letter from your bank saying you have these funds. That's when typically the listing agent will ask for proof of funds. Now it's, it's very, it's more uncommon that if you show them your pre-approval letter, then that they would at, also ask you for proof of funds. So say, for example, you show them that you're pre-approved for FHA for you know 500,000, and then they see that pre-approval letter, they probably won't turn around and, and also ask you for proof of funds. Like, let me see your down payment. Like I'm borrowing the 500,000. I've shown that to you. You don't need to know what's in my bank account as well. Like I'm, I have a pre-approval showing you that I can purchase this home. So I think that's what you're talking about. So it's not unusual. It's very common when people are paying cash is less common if you've already shown them your pre-approval letter. So if you, Yelena, if you want to um, ask a follow-up question to that, you may be able to get it in um, before we get off. All right, let me see. All right, I reached out. Sam says, I reached out to a realtor and he asked for my credit score and income and what I have saved. 
I don't think he's a lender. Yeah, that's something I never ask. So, and sometimes that can be, um, and let's talk about fair housing for a second. Um, I would never ask, the most I would ask a person is, are you pre-approved? I'm not going to ask them how much they money they make. I'm not going to ask them their credit score. Those are all questions for typically the lender. So if somebody's coming to me and they're not approved, hey, are you pre-approved? No. Do you need a recommendation to a lender? And then I, you know, recommend them a lender. But I'm not going to ask them because what I there's I'm not qualifying them, right? So why do I need to know their credit score? Why do I need to know their income and what they have saved? Um, I'm trying to think if I've ever asked anybody this. I may have asked them, do you have money for closing costs? And I'm asking them because do you need down payment assistance? So, and then I would recommend some down payment assistance, but you want to make sure, and this is part of fair housing, whatever I'm asking one client, I have to ask every client. And this is something that happened a lot. It's, it probably still happens right now. It actually does still happen where, you know, either by race, by ethnicity, about, you know, by age, all of that kind of stuff, they'll ask different questions to different potential clients. So if you're not asking, for example, if one person comes to you and you, the first thing you ask them is, are you pre-approved, right? So they say, I want to see blah, blah, blah house. And you're like, are you pre-approved? What's your credit score? What's your income? Then you have to ask everybody that same, those same questions. But there's no real reason that a, a agent should be asking for your credit score, your income, and how much you have saved. They should be recommending you to a lender if they're asking you, you know, are you pre-approved yet? That's the most they should ask you. Are you pre-approved? And if you're not pre-approved, do you need a lender recommendation so you can get pre-approved? But so that would be a red flag for me. I took it as a conversation to know what I can buy. Yeah, they need to know what you can buy by getting you pre-approved. So, you know, that I'm trying to think about ask. The only other question I may ask is what, what mortgage payment are you comfortable with? I may ask somebody that to know if they're thinking about what area of town they want to move in. I'm like, okay, what mortgage, com what's the most you would pay for your mortgage? And then I would say, okay, homes, um, in this price range or in that area. But yeah, I'm not going to ask questions that, you know, are more for lenders. So that would kind of be a red flag for me. I'm not saying it'd be a definite red flag, but they should have asked, they should have referred you to a lender so they can get you pre-approved. And they don't need to ask you those questions. I think there was a follow-up to that. Um, unless he's using that information to refer you to a lender, they don't need to ask those questions at all. They can just give you the lender's information and then refer you to them, right? They don't need to, they don't come to the lender and say, hey, this person has a 780 and this person makes 500,000 and this, you know, they will, the lender will get that information, okay? So it'd be kind of a red flag for me that they're asking those that much, those, those specific questions. All right, she says, can your pre-approval amount change once you go through underwriting? Mm, typically no, unless it needs to. So um, I'm thinking if you got pre-approved, say for 400,000, um, your income would have to change for you to get pre-approved for more, or maybe you paid off some debt. So say that you were pre-approved a month ago or two months ago, but in that time you've paid off debt, you have increased your income, then it may increase that way. But if nothing's changed, then the pre-approval amount should not change either. But good question. I have a full video about underwriting. So you want to check that out. I is down payment assistance a negative when you're first when you are first when you're a first time buyer getting a mortgage loan. Okay. In a seller's market, Yes, it was a negative in many cases because sellers had a lot of choices. So if they were getting multiple offers, so say a seller was getting 10 offers on their home, they were putting the ones that had down payment assistance aside, right? In a lot of cases, because there's a little bit more that comes sometimes with, with offers with down payment assistance. It may take you longer to close when you're using down payment assistance. It also means that you cannot buy my home unless you get down payment assistance. And what if your down payment assistance doesn't come through? So it makes it a, a less reliable in a lot of cases. It makes it a less reliable offer than somebody that has all the funds that they need themselves. And they're not relying on a down payment assistance program to help them buy this 
you know, their home. So just be mindful of that. As we move into, a lot of people are already in a balanced market. They're not in a seller's market anymore. I don't know how many areas are in buyer's markets um, yet, but a lot of people are entering a balanced market. And that means you're going to find a lot of homes that don't have any offers on them. So when a seller doesn't have any offers, yes, they'll take a, a offer with down payment assistance because they have nothing else, right? So just be mindful of what kind of market you're in to know whether or not, you know, how favorable they will be to an offer that includes down payment assistance. So with the, the fewer offers, the better, right? Because you don't want to have to be compared to a lot of different offers. But a lot of times, some, some sellers may think, okay, I use down payment assistance when I bought my first house. And they may feel a certain, you know, um, a, a certain connection to you and your offer. So you never know um, with some sellers, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't put offers out there that have down payment assistance thinking that you're not going to get it because you never know. And sometimes, especially in the seller's market, um, down payment assistance offered ha offers try to you know offer a little bit more. But again, if it's in a balanced market or a buyer's market, you don't have to do all of that. So it's very, watch my video on, um, you know, things that you need to be mindful of putting an offer in, in 2020, 2023. Um, it talks about some of those things. All righty, Rochelle, I got the notification. Did I miss a lot? Hopefully not. I'm not sure when you signed on, but we're on for about an hour. So it is, um, it is winding down. Um, all right, Andy has a good question. What traits distinguish a good realtor from a bad one? I think I'm going to go back to that. Communication would be number one, just making sure you're communicating with your clients because um, that's an, um, a, a huge complaint of first-time home buyers. But I would also say that you know your area because I... I get a lot of emails now that I'm on YouTube from all over the place, but my agent didn't do this. And I'm, you know, after they close, right. And that's why I made the guide. So I made sure to say like, okay, make sure you're doing all of these things. Cause I don't know what your agent is doing. Right. But a lot of times your agent may not be as knowledgeable about the area you're buying in as you think, particularly in large metropolitan areas. Right. So there's a large area. So if I say I work in Metro Atlanta or I work in Dallas, Dallas is huge. Atlanta is huge. But do you know about the city that I'm buying in? Right. And so sometimes it's important that that agent knows some details about like what's coming soon. I don't want to buy a house and, you know, there's a big, you know, all these warehouses or something that's coming out right, right behind my land. And sometimes local agents are more aware of what's going on in that area than somebody that just works the metro area. OK, um, and so I just want to make sure that you are working with somebody that's familiar with the area that you're buying in, not just the larger you know, area. And then communication, knowing your area. And I was going to say something else. Can't think of it right now. Um, and then, OK, number three would be they've worked with people like you in the past. And this is what I mean by that. A lot of people, like I was, you know, working with a lot of people with down payment assistance. So I knew what to do. I knew what the lenders were. I knew how it worked, what they had to do. Um, so I, it was very easy for me to get them, get them through using down payment assistance to get their offer accepted, to do all of those things. So you want to make sure that buyers, some, some agents say they all, they do luxury all the time. Right. And you come to them and they're like, Oh, you know, they're on Instagram and they're like really good. And they're closing all these deals. And you're coming to them and you're like, I, I, I need down payment assistance and I'm using this. And they're like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Right. So you want to make sure that they've done some deals in what you're trying to do. Um, for example, I try to do a 203 K I never done a 203 K I'm walking through it. If you know, if I was an age, if I was a first time home buyer and I wanted to do a 203K, I would be trying to look for an agent that's done a 203K recently. I want somebody that has some success in an area that I'm already trying to do, right? So um, I think those are the three major things. I also, if your agent is new, this is the last thing, if your agent is new, I want y'all to have, I did like a little TikTok thing on this. I want you to have a threesome, right? If you have a new agent, it needs to be you, your agent, and they need a mentor. 
I would not, if I'm an, a first time home buyer, I do not want a new agent. And agents probably hate this, but it's just the truth. It's like the blind leading the blind, right? That new agent, I'm not saying you cannot hire them. You need to know who their mentor is. All new agents should have a mentor through their first three transactions. So somebody else that's been in the business longer that knows exactly what they're doing so they don't mess you up, right? Because there's a lot of, unless you have a lot of experience, every transaction is a little bit different. You need somebody that's that's taking you through that process. So if your agent is pretty new and you can tell like, hey, how many deals have you closed? How long have you been licensed? All of those questions you're asking them, if they're new, then you need to say, hey, I really want to work with you. Um, but who is mentoring you through your first three few transactions? You need to make sure they have a mentor. I don't want a new, a first time home buyer working with a new agent. Um, because you know, there's a lot of things that they may not be prepared for, or they may not have seen before. And they need somebody else that's mentoring them through those first three few transactions. Um, and, and um, Rhonda just asked us, Hey, Miss Miss Hill, I'm a new agent in Virginia. Congratulations. What suggestions do you have for new agents to succeed in real estate business? So, number, I'm gonna give you like three. Number one, you need a mentor. Don't think just because um, you pass your real estate license course, right, that you know everything. You don't know everything. And the mentor agent will be so valuable to you that they're worth, because typically you have to pay them a portion of your commission. It, it's different at every brokerage, but it may be that, you know, if, if they're mentoring you through a transaction, you have to pay them a percentage of your, your commission. But I'm telling you, it is worth it. Okay, so it's the only reason that some people may not use a mentor. It's like, I don't want to share my commission, but you need that experience. You need that knowledge. You need that information to help you as you grow your business. So definitely try to get mentored through your first three transactions at least, right? So that's number one. Number two, get out into your area. So if you're new, you need to be looking at houses. I don't care if you have no clients, go out, look at like five homes on the market every, you know, every day you're available, start looking at homes, look at, you know, what's on your market, know what's coming soon, and then start on social media. You need clients, get on social media, talking about your area, like talk about your area of expertise. Even if you're just beginning, um, you know, start talking about, you know, you live in New Jersey, start talking about the different neighborhoods in New Jersey, the open houses that you went to, what's happening in your market. So those are like the first three things you probably need to start doing is, I did I say three things, <laughs> know your area, get a mentor and get started on social media, because that's where a lot of people are hiring their agents now on social media. But congratulations, it's a good business to be in. Um, I know a lot of first time home buyers watch, I mean, not a lot of new agents watch my videos because I kind of break things down. Um, so I would definitely watch my videos about the home buying process. So you understand that as well. All right. I'm going to answer a few more questions. Um, let me go through here really quickly. Okay. EB says, amen. No new agents without mentors. Again, blind. I feel like it's a blind leading the blind. And I've said that different times. And agents are like, well, how do you expect... I had a mentor. Remember, I was licensed in, two, in 2003 and I taught for a long time. So I was out of real estate. Like I wasn't like in it deep. Right. So my first few transactions when I got back in real estate, like, you know, in 2016, I was mentored through those first three transactions. And it was, you know, the the contracts had changed. The market has changed everything. And I was like, OK, what should I do now? What should I you know, I was I had a mentor through my first three transactions. So I don't see why some of these agents. Um, and again, I have been licensed. I'm almost been licensed for at this point, 20 years. Right. But I still, when I was, I was out of it for so long that I was like, okay, I, I'm getting back into it. I need to be mentored because I'm not, you're messing with people's money. Okay. This is when people are spending five, the most expensive thing in their, um, that they'll probably buy in their lifetime. You don't want to mess that up. And I didn't want to mess it up. So I made sure I knew exactly, you know, I knew what I was doing in 2003. I need to make sure I, I know what I'm doing in 2016, right? So I, you know, I had mentors through my all of my transactions. You need to, or my first three transactions, and I would ask them everything. I'm about to do this, what I need to do next, what I need to do next. And these had been agents that had been in the business, you know, 
for 20 years or more. And I can mentor people now. Yeah, I can make sure you're doing this, make sure you're doing that. So that mentorship piece is very, very important. And again, I'm going to say it 10 times. I don't care if, you know, they're the best thing ever. You've seen them 50 million times. If they're a new agent, they need to have a mentor. If they don't have a mentor and they don't know who you, they can't tell you who their mentor is and all of that, don't work with them. Um, you're just taking too big of a risk as a first time home buyer working with a new agent. You don't know and they don't know. Even if they think they know, they don't know. Um, all right, this is a good point. I had the wrong agent. She primarily worked with investors. Like a lot of agents have their specialty. You know, my specialty was first time home buyers. I work and it was seniors. It was seniors and first time home buyers for the most part. People that were downsizing and then um and first time home buyers. But a lot of agents have their they're specialized in luxury. They specialize work, working with investors. They specialize in condos, right? I, if you're buying a condo, I want you to work with an agent that's closed some condos before because they know the questions to ask. I have a condo video, but you want to work with an agent that works with clients like you a lot, a lot. So because they know, um, you know, they know the best things to ask. They know the best way to guide you through that transaction. And they could be an excellent luxury agent, but when it comes to first time home buyers, they're not good at all, but they'll still take you as a client. Um, and then you, you're you not happy with their service. So just make sure that you, um, you think about that before you choose an agent to work with. Um, all right. And then Ms. Amaraja put up um, a video I made about things that you need to make sure you're asking your agent. All right. How can you figure out if an agent has experience in certain situations? This is a good question. It's going to be my last question. Um, a few things. Make sure that I'll post again my guide, first time home buyers group, if you need a referral. Also, if you're watching the replay in the 24 hours, all of the questions will be time stamped in this video. But OK, this is a good question from Paxton. How can you figure out if an agent has experience in certain situations? You ask. So, and that's okay. So, if, say I'm a first time home buyer using down payment assistance. When's the last time you closed somebody that's using down payment assistance? And could you explain how their process went? And you could show me the house. Like they could, you could say they bought, they should be able to say, hey, they bought this house. They used this program. They did this because they're showing you what they've done before. They show you where the house is, you know, what down payment assistance they've used. So, you basically you want to say, could you tell me um, an experience you've had in the last year with a client that has, you know, bought a home over a million dollars? How did that transaction go? Were they using a jumbo loan? You know, how did everything work out? Could you tell me about, you know, a transaction you've closed that was multifamily, you know, that you've done in the last year or so? How did that transaction go? What lender did they use? That sort of thing. So whatever your situation is, can you tell me what the client that you worked with that moved from a different state and how that worked? Right. So whatever your situation is. Um, can you tell me about a time that you've sold somebody's house and they bought a new house and how that transaction went? So you're asking them to tell you of a previous client that they've worked with and how that transaction went. And they should be able to tell you that story, right? They should be able to tell you, hey, they were moving from Arizona to Texas and we went ahead and put their house on the market. And then I showed them homes through video and then they flew in and we, you know, they should be able to tell you how that transaction worked. Now, if they're kind of like not being able to pull, you know, these stories together, then that might not be the person for you. Um, another example, tell me about somebody you've worked with that, you know, was a, that you found a house for, say that the average house is 500,000 and you're approved for 300,000. Can you tell me what the last person you worked with that, you know, bought a house in the 300,000 range and how that worked? How long did it take you to find them a house? Um, was it easy for you to find them a house? Where did they buy the house? So all you can go by price range, you can go by experience, you can go by, Say you're buying a mobile home. When's the last mobile home you see? You know, you want to be very specific asking them, could you tell me, you know, when you've worked with somebody like me, be it price range, down payment assistance, location, um, property type. You can ask all of those things. Um, even in your city, when's the last time you've closed somebody that lived or moved to this city? Um, you can be as specific um, 
as possible. I have questions specific to your lender or loan officer, but you can ask specific, you know, there'll be different questions that you'll ask, but you can ask like, especially for down payment assistance, things like that. You can ask if, you know, have you done a 203k loan before? Um, have you, you know, closed somebody with down payment assistance before? What did they use? Yeah. So you can ask very similar questions um, to your lender, but those are the types of questions you want to ask your agent before you, you know, agree to work with them and then say, hey, I'll do a 90 day agreement with you so we can see how this goes. Um, I think that's reasonable. Um, you know, that's what I do. And I used to do it because I was like, I don't, because at one point I was getting so many clients. I was like, I need to get, I need to be able to get out <laughs> easily as well. But I just stuck to it. I said, okay, 90 days. If I can't find you something in 90 days, we'll regroup and go from there. But thank you so much, Paxton. Thank you. Um, yes, please rewind and watch the replay. I will be going live at least two times a month. So please have your notifications on so you don't miss a live. Thank you so much for all of um, the support and watching my videos and, you know, supporting my channel. Thank you so much and have a good night.